Hello, fourth graders. So this week we are back in our social studies textbooks and workbooks. And in the previous weeks, we talked about different parts of the US. So we talked about the Northeast and historical things that happened there. We talked about the Southeast and now we're finally on the Midwest. And so if you're following along in your practice book or your um, workbook, then we're on page 146. And for this chapter, these are the lessons that we're gonna go over. So lesson one, the land in the Midwest, pathways of the plains, building cities, the modern Midwest, and then the last lesson, which is America's heartland. And the main thing that we're gonna be answering inside this chapter is how does the Midwest reflect the spirit of America? And we're gonna be reading about Native Americans who first lived in this region. Then we're gonna be talking about what happened when settlers moved into that same region and what happened to the people who were originally there. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the climate, the geography, so the lands, different types, and then how this led to the types of businesses that they have now. So you'll see kind of a past to present um, view of the same area throughout the chapter. So you can even see it, the land of the Midwest, and eventually gets to the modern Midwest. And you guys do have a chapter, um, a project for this chapter. You're going to be working either in pairs, depending on if you're able to find a partner, um, or you'll be working on your own to create a road trip throughout the Midwest. So the first thing that I want you to think about is what does the Midwest mean? We know that the East, um, the Northeast was like states like Maine, New York, Delaware, pretty much uh, the 13 original colonies. We know that the, that was the Northeast, the Southeast were states like Florida, Georgia, Atlanta, um, Atlanta, Georgia, and then Alabama and those states. So if you're thinking about the states that are part of the Midwest, what states do you think of? So just take a second and go through, you know, if you know the states, all 50 of them if you want, and think which states do you think are part of the Midwest? And if you thought of North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, Indiana, Michigan, or Ohio, then you're correct. All of those states count as part of the Midwest. But then we have to ask ourselves, why is the Midwest important? Because we're on the West Coast. So why, think about it for a second, why do you think that the Midwest is an important part of the United States? I'm sure you know why California is important to the United States, but why do you think that part of the US is important for the whole country? So just pause and think for a second before we get started on what this project is gonna be asking you to do. When you're ready, we're gonna go through the project checklist. So in this project, you're going to be making a road trip through the Midwest. If you choose to make your road trip based on um, a couple of states that are nearby to each other, that's an option. If you want to choose four or five interesting places in the Midwest to visit, so if you wanna choose places that are national monuments or have um, uh, geographic features that you wanna visit or see, those are all places you can add to your road trip. And then you're gonna choose from those locations based on historical events, um, important centers for the economy. So it can even be about business if you want or homes of famous leaders. And then you're going to map and describe your locations to finish your road trip plan. So you can, you can create this online if you wanna make it on a Google Slides form. Um, if you want to use uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, that's an option. And you can also do it on paper. So you could use a poster board and create your road trip um, just depending on how you wanna do it. Just make sure that if you're submitting it online, if you're sending pictures of your submission, that you upload it. You take pictures of it if it's on, um, if it's on posters or on a poster board type of thing, take pictures of it and make sure that they're clear. So that way we can read all the information that you're gathering. So these, these are the important details that you need to have inside there. First thing, you need to choose an area to focus on. Uh, 
it says here you can choose the Great Lakes or a particular state or even several states close together. If, it, if you choose one of the states that we just talked about, so North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, Ohio, Minnesota, Kansas, any of those states, um, you need to show how you would be traveling between them because you can't just appear in one and disappear in another. Then you're going to be looking for interesting events places, people, or industries. Industries are a type of business in the area that you chose. So find something interesting about these, these places that you're researching. You can't just say Ohio and then not explain why. You've got to be able to explain why you chose that state. Then you're going to decide how you want to present it. So this is how I was saying if you want to present it using paper or um, on a poster. That's one option. If you want to do it on a computer, you can do it that way too. Uh, if I recall, you guys had to do a PowerPoint at some point. And so I know that you all, you're all able to do it. So that's definitely an option if you want to submit it that way. And then you have to write a description of each place that you chose for your trip. So if you chose the Great Lakes, um, you have to explain where it's at. You have to explain what's famous about it and why you chose it. And then the last thing you're going to do is assemble your road trip plan, which includes visuals to help illustrate your trip. We've talked about visuals before. You need to have pictures in your, po in your project. Um, yes, you can totally draw it out. Uh, it's better if you use images so that way we can see exactly what you're talking about but make sure that it's actually of the things or the places that you've chosen. And then once you have all of that information together, you have completed your project. And down here, you can write any research questions that you think will help you plan your project. So this can include questions like, what states are you interested in? Um, you can go through the Midwest states, write them down here and circle which ones you want um, or which ones sound interesting to you, which ones have you already heard about? These are all important questions that might make it easier for you rather than looking at maybe at least seven states. You could definitely narrow it down and you could definitely see based on a map or something, which states um, are closer together, which states could be uh, something or could have something that you're already interested in. So make sure you consider all of those things before you get started. And of course, at the end of the chapter, they're going to have a, um, a part that does review all of this information, but it's good for you to get started now. So that way, when we start reading and we start answering this essential question of how the Midwest reflects the spirit of America, you're already thinking about how to answer that question. And you're already looking for states um, based on interesting uh, places in there. So once you're ready, we're going to get started and get to page 148. Here's your uh, vocabulary for this chapter. So we have alternative energy. We have assembly line, automation, discrimination, drainage, expedition, invasive, irrigation, prairie, and reservation. And so you already know that if you've heard it, then you can definitely check that. If you already know what it means, you can check that. And if you don't know it, then this is where you're going to be writing your definitions for each and every one of these words. If you already know what the definitions are, fantastic. You're ahead of the curve. Um, for if you don't, that's okay. We're gonna go through the definitions one by one. So make sure you have your pencil out and you're ready to write down the definitions. So for our first word, we have alternative energy. Make sure you've already checked it if you already know it. If you have only heard of it, then you can check that too and you'll still be writing the definition. And if you don't know it, you're definitely gonna be writing the definition. If you do know it, you're still writing the definition. So make sure you still have it down. Alternative energy which is energy produced from a renewable resource that creates little or no pollution. So an example of this is if you've ever driven to Arizona or if you've ever gone to um, East 
San Diego County or to Julian or Ramona, there are wind farms. So they look like giant windmills um, or pinwheels and they use the wind to create and harness electricity. So that's an example of alternative energy. The second word we have here is assembly line, which is an arrangement of machines, equipment, and workers in which work passes from operation to operation in a direct line until a product is made. So if you were going to think of it in the sense that if you were making food and one person maybe uh, creates the filling of, of something that you're trying to make, another person wraps it up, and then the third person fries it. So when one person is done with their job, they pass it to the next person. Then the last person is the person who just adds their part and then they pass it to the next one. So that is an assembly line. The third one is automation. The method of making a device or process or a system operate by itself. You've seen that happen all the time with automatic doors when you enter a store or um, lights that automatically turn on. The fourth one is discrimination, the act of treating a person or a group unfairly by other people or groups. So this is essentially to, to treat one group better or worse, or in this sense, um, not equally to another group for whatever reason. Then is drainage, which is a system used to remove water or wa liquid waste. You've seen a drain. Um, drainage systems are all over the city. Expedition, a journey or trip undertaken for a specific purpose. So if you say uh, we took an, there was an expedition to cross the United States, it's the same thing as a journey or a trip. Usually you would include the reason. So we took an expedition across the United States to map um, the whole of America. Then is invasive, which means tending to spread. Usually this is used in terms of animals or plants that are not native to the United States, but they take over because there are no plants or animals that can fight it. And so in the United States, there are a lot of regulations, even there's a lot of rules about which type of plants you can or can't plant. Um, even animals, we don't allow all animals to be brought to the United States because they can have illnesses that other animals inside the United States that just live here naturally um, don't have. And that's just because uh, the United States or even um, North and South America have its own ecosystem. They're not connected with other countries. They're not connected with other continents. And so uh, things that are here are very unique and things that are there on the other side of the world are gonna be unique to that part of the world. Then we have irrigation, which is the use of canals, ditches, and pipes to bring water to dry land. If you are trying to water your plants, water your farm, um, water your garden even, then you're probably going to use pipes. Um, before you would have used canals or ditches. So you would have dug a hole and allowed the water to go through and it would have connected water from one side to the other side. Then you have the word prairie, which is a large area of level or rolling grassland. I'll show you guys a photo of what a prairie looks like um, because it is, it looks like a huge field. Um, and the good thing about it is that they're beautiful and a lot of animals graze on them and use them as a source of food. The bad thing about them is that they catch fire pretty easily. So prairies are, prairie fires are very common. And then the last one is reservation. So you might've heard this in a restaurant or if you are trying to go somewhere, you might've heard your parents say, that we have to make a reservation or book a reservation. Um, in this case, it means a land or an area of public land set aside for a specific purpose. So that means that you've taken land and you've said, we're just gonna use it for this. And um, 
later on, you're going to be reading about different reservations across the United States. Once you're done writing, you can go ahead and continue to the next page. So for lesson one, we're going to be talking about the Midwest climate and the geography that of how it affected early people. So we've talked about it before. Think about it for a second. Who were the first people to live in the United States before it was even called the United States? Who was living here? And if you're resourceful, you might even see it on the page. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about um, the climate, the geography, and how it affected the people uh, living here in the United States, but specifically in the Midwest. Why are you learning about it? You're going to be learning about the Midwest so that way you can understand how the Midwest changed over time and how it was in the beginning in comparison to now, especially for the first people that lived there. And at the end of this, you're going to be talking about how the climate and geography of the Midwest um, played a role in why the Midwest looks a certain way. So if you weren't sure about who lived here first, we have it as the caption of this photo, or I guess this painting. So the first thing we're gonna do on page 152 is analyze the source and we're going to read, we're going to be looking at the inspect bar right here. We're gonna be looking at the title what do you think this lesson is going to be about? We already know that the title is talking about Buffalo Hide Paintings. So think for a second. And then you can even respond down here underneath where it says my notes about what you think Buffalo Hide Paintings are. You're going to underline what features characterize Buffalo Hide Painting. So if it says characterize, that means it's going to be describing Buffalo Hide Paintings. So you're going to be looking for information that's talking about or describing Buffalo Hide Paintings. And you're going to circle the reason buffalo hides were used. So there's, you already know to read it, which you're not annotating, but you're going to be underlining and you're going to be circling. So make sure that your pages have those features. And then we'll get started. Buffalo hide paintings. Vast herds of bison lived in the Great Plains before the 1900s. These bison are often re referred to as buffalo. Native Americans of the plains relied on the buffalo. Women tanned the buffalo hides to make them smooth. The hides were used as tarps, teepees, blankets, and clothing. Each skin had a furry side and a smooth side. People wore robes with the fur against their bodies to protect them from the harsh winters. See if you can find the main idea inside that paragraph. What is that paragraph talking about? What is that paragraph repeating again and again as the main thing that it's trying to tell you? And you can even write it on the side right here for what you think the main idea could be. Let's continue to the second paragraph. Hides had uses other than warmth. Talented artists painted shapes and scenes in different colors on the smooth sides of the robes. Women usually wore hides decorated with shapes and patterns. Men's robes often showed large scenes. Some robes featured warriors coming home after a raid. Others showed men riding horses. So again, same thing. See if you can find the main information that it's talking about in this paragraph. Sick people wore hides with healing symbols they believed would help them get well again. Leaders and holy people had special hides that displayed their importance in the community. Holy men and women used the hides to communicate with the spirit world. Some plains people recorded their history on buffalo hide paintings. Leaders, the most important, leaders chose the most important event from the year, and artists added a special, added a picture to represent their that event. Tribe members could identify what year they were born by the event shown on the hide. They called these hides winter counts. So let's look at this primary source and read the caption. Native Americans painted scenes that told important stories on buffalo hides. So you're going to be rereading here to find um, which ways buffalo hides helped the Plains people. Underline the differences between the ways that men and women used hides. And then think about the reason why they would use hides um, or why they had them as 
named as winter counts. What reason would you have to label a year or to um, write down what year something happened? Why do you think that's important? Can you think of anything that happened maybe this year or last year? And if someone came five years from now and you said that you were born during that year, the year that uh, maybe even COVID happened, the year that um, something important happened and you told them, maybe not the number, but you told them something important that happened, do you think that, that information would be important? And if you think yes, then why? So make sure that you um, write that in your notes part right here. And for the next page, we're going to be exploring with the ask and answer questions. We ask questions to get information. A question often begins with a who, what, when, where, why, or how. To answer a question, look for details that support the answer you find. Ask a question using who, what, where, when, why, or how. When you read, pay attention to something you don't understand. Ask yourself a W question or a how question. So make sure you check with yourself. You're not just reading all of these details and all this information just to collect it. You have to ask yourself, why are they doing this? What was the reason? Those are both examples of um, W questions. Then look for details in the text that would support your answer. So you're gonna be looking for an answer based on the information that you read. And you're gonna be trying to find an answer from that information that you read. Then you're gonna be answering your question. Use the details that you found to formulate an answer to your question. Formulate just means create. So use your details that you found to create an answer to your question. So here's the question that they gave us. Why did the Plains people paint buffalo hides? Let's see if we can find anything inside the text um, talking about why they painted it. You can use the example for talking about the winter counts, showing the main things that were going on during that time. You can talk about how people used it to heal. You can even talk about how people used it for decoration. Those are at least three ways that you can explain why they painted the, the buffalo hides. And you can write your explanation here. So the question's already there. You don't have to look for a question, but you're going to be writing one of those details um, that we just uh, talked about here. So if you wanna say, they painted buffalo hides to show the year, to keep track of time, then you could write that. Um, you can even quote it directly from the text. So if I were going to do this, I could say, tribe members could identify the year they were born by the events shown on that hide. I would take exactly this part right here and then use it for why I, for my supporting detail. And then for my actual answer, that's when I would write it in my own words that um, you could use buffalo hides to tell how many years ago someone was born or um, who else was born in that same year if they all knew the event that they were talking about. If you chose a different answer, so if you chose uh, for decoration, then you could you could write the quote about how uh, Native Americans uh, decorated buffalo hides um, differently for men and for women, and that's your supporting detail. And then you can write your answer, um, being that that buffalo hides were a form of clothing, and so they had different forms of decoration. They could show history on them. Um, like with the battle scenes, or they could have different types of designs depending on who was wearing it. So it all depends on how you want to choose your sporting details. You have at least three sporting details to choose from over there and make sure that you show which, um, where you got it from. You can even say paragraph one, two, three, and then your answer, write that in your own words. So your explanation, that's what your answer is gonna be. And that is your assignment for Wednesday. When you are done with that, then you can get started on Thursday's assignment if you want to get ahead, or you can get started on that tomorrow. For Thursday's homework, 
you have to read page 184 to 193 in your research companion. And you're going to be using your skills to find text evidence that provides supporting details. So same thing is down there. Um, text information to help you find, answer your questions. And the chart is going to organize your information. So they already gave us the questions. Let's go through them. The first one is, why did Native Americans build mounds? The second one is, how did physical features of the Midwest benefit early peoples? Third one is, how do tornadoes, the lake effect, and the seasons affect the Midwest? What natural resources did the inhabitants of the Midwest use? Why were animals important to the Sioux? So based on these questions, we can also kind of guess what's gonna be happening inside the readings. So make sure that when you're reading it, you're looking for those details to explain and to cite your answers because you need to be able to show Yes, you can find an answer, you can write it out first, but you need to be able to show where you got that idea from. Where did you get that, that information from? And you can quote it directly from the text. So let's get started on your reading. If you are following along in your textbook, we're on page 184. And we're going to be talking about how did the Midwest climate and geography affect early peoples. So we talked about the more modern versions of the Midwest and how it's probably a lot different than um, how the Midwest looks today, or a lot different than how it used to look. But now we're actually going to go through and read about how it might have looked. And so Let's get started on our reading. Mound Builders of the Midwest. Between 200 BC and 8400, Native Americans living in the Midwest built sacred centers near their towns. These centers were large mounds of earth covering wooden frames. The mounds were made of different shapes. Some were cone-shaped and served as temples and burial sites. The Hopwell people, built mounds in Southern Ohio. In addition to being religious centers, these mounds provided protection from their enemies. The tallest Hopwell hop mounds reached 30 feet. Other early peoples in the Midwest used, also used mounds. In around 400 AD, groups in Minnesota and Wisconsin built smaller mounds. Some of these were built in the shapes of birds, animals, or beings they believed in the underworld, lived in the underworld. The Mississippian culture lived in Illinois and Missouri starting around 700 AD. They built large towns surrounded by smaller villages. Large mounds in the center of the town were places for rituals and the homes of the town's leader. The largest Mississippian city, Cahokia, was located near present day St. Louis, Missouri. The Mississippian culture thrived for hundreds of years, but declined around 1600 AD. This may be due to the arrival of European explorers or using up the natural resources. And we have here a caption of this image. So of course, because during that time, cameras hadn't been invented yet. This is a guess of what they think based on archeology, span which is the study of um, essentially the study of the past using uh, artifacts and things that they found buried. So this is a guess, but this is based on the land at the time and based on research that they've made, that they've done. So it says here, Cahokia was the largest city of the Mississippian people. Physical features of the Midwest. Pause for a second and if you see anything that you think will answer the questions on your investigate. So just now we just talked about Native Americans and why they built mounds. If you wanted to include those details, make sure that you show uh, exactly what you're talking about. So if you wanted to ex include information about the mounds, write it here. And then of course, writing your answer in your own words, um, make sure you fill out both of these in your neatest handwriting. And so as we go through them, make sure you're keeping in mind these questions. 
because you're going to be answering them by the end of it. Physical features of the Midwest. The Midwest is home to a variety of physical features. The Central Plains and the Great Plains are two main landforms. The Black Hills are mountains, are mountains rich with wildlife and forests. The Ozark Plateau is an area of highlands with rugged hills, caves, and underground springs. Badlands contain deep gullies and colorful mountains with flat tops. Water features of the Midwest include major rivers and the Great Lakes. So we have Lake Superior here, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie. And here are some of the states, how they look now. So you might be able to recognize some of them. Um, down here is Illinois. I wanna say here is Michigan. Here is Minnesota. Um, and here is North and South Dakota. Um, but I can't remember what this one is right now. So, but from here, you can see the lakes start from here and all these blue lines, those are all rivers. And they kind of follow along where the states end too. So there are all these little borders based on these river pathways. And these tiny ones right here are also lakes. Waterways. The rivers and lakes in the Midwest have always been important to the people living in the region. During flood season, the Mississippi River and its tributaries drain most of North America. The Russian water deposits rich soil throughout the Mississippi drainage basin. We have a highlighted word there. If you remember, uh, we talked about drainage. And if you can recall what drainage means, then you already know that we're going to, here it's going to be talking about removing water from one area to another. And in this one, it was making the lands more fertile. So that means that plants could grow easily here because of this drainage. The, Miss the Missouri River and the Ohio River served as a transportation route for the region. The five Great Lakes are Lake Superior, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, um, and Lake Michigan. Together, they make up the largest source of fresh water in the world. Most of the lakes serve as a border between the United States and Canada. Forests grow in many areas around the lake. And here we, the caption for this photo is, the shores of the Great Lakes feature natural beauty, like the pictured rocks in National Lakeshore on Lake Superior in Michigan. Early Native Americans lived near water for several reasons. They used waterways to travel by boat from place to place. Rivers and lakes provided fish for food. Fertile soils near rivers was good for growing crops. Then we have the Midwestern Plains. The, the Great Plains covered one third of the area of the United States. Large herds of buffalo roamed the grassy plains and low hills in this area. The animals provided an important source for Native Americans living on the plain. The Central Plains run between the Ohio River and the Great Lakes. This area receives more of the rain than the Great Plains. The land is flat or gently rolling. The Great River valleys make the land fertile and good for farming. So again and again, we've seen that they've talked about farming. They've talked about how um, the land around the lakes is rich and how the rivers have made it fertile, which means that it's good for growing crops. So what do you think that the Midwest is going to be useful for? What do you think we use it for now? This is just some questions to help you think about what we do, what the past has to do with how we use the plains or these areas in the present. Here we have a caption for this photo down here, which says the Badlands in South Dakota feature unusual formations and numerous mammal fossils. Uh, if I recall correctly, one of the largest fossils in archeology span was discovered here because the land is so, um, the land is great for finding things frozen in stone, not literally frozen, but in terms of uh, not a lot of water has been going over it and it's been pressed together. So there's going to be a lot of fossils in this area. 
Let's go to the next page. Now we've got climate. Geography plays a role in the weather of the Midwest. It contributes to the formation of seasonal storms, such as tornadoes, blizzards, um, tornadoes and blizzards. It also contributes to extreme temperature ranges from bitterly cold winters to very hot summers. Weather factor, plains. The Rocky Mountains direct hot air from the south into cooler air in the north. The different air temperatures clash over the wide flat plains. This causes violent thunderstorms to form during the spring and summer months. During these storms, tornadoes can develop. These dark columns of spinning clouds can produce wind speeds of more than 200 miles per hour, but most produce winds of less than 113 miles per hour. A section of the plains running through the central United States is known as Tornado Alley. This is because so many tornadoes occur in this area each year. Tornadoes also rumble through other parts of the Midwest, destroying homes or property in minutes. You might have recall, you might have uh, heard about this in the news even, that um, there was actually a tornado recently. And if you've seen uh, The Wizard of Oz, she lives in Kansas, which is right in the middle of Tornado Alley and right in the middle of the Midwest. Weather factor, lake effect. Severe weather in the Midwest is not limited to one time of year. In the winter, the Great Lakes cause the lake effect storms. These snowstorms are a result of uh, large differences in temperature of the land and nearby water. As cold air travels across warm lakes, the air warms and becomes more humid. As it rises, it cools again. The water in the air forms clouds and causes precipitation. Precipitation is another way to say rain or um, some form of rain. Over land, this moisture becomes snow, which is another form of rain. The Great Lakes area is one of the only places in the world that experiences lake effect weather. The seasons. Oh, and the caption for this photo says, tornadoes can form over flatlands. Tornadoes can form over the flatlands of the Midwest, the seasons. The Midwest experiences all four seasons. San Diego does not, but the Midwest does. Temperatures in the Midwest vary widely between summer and winter. While temperatures in the winter can fall below zero, most times they range between 30 degrees and 40 degrees Fahrenheit. The winter brings snow to much of the Midwest. Summers can be hot and humid and bring thunderstorms. During the spring and fall, temperatures range between 50 degrees and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. San Diego usually stays more in the 70 degrees Fahrenheit. We don't really get um, anywhere below maybe 30 or 40. Did you know? Predicting weather. Early people in the Midwest faced the dangerous weather season without the benefit of modern technology. For centuries, people predicted the weather by observing clouds and wind. Today, meteorologists or scientists who study the weather use tools to predict the weather. Doppler radar senses the rate of rain, hail, and snow, as well as the speed and direction of the wind. Satellites provide the means to see clouds over large areas of the earth. A barometer measures air pressure, which tells when the weather will change. With the information collected, computers predict the strength of storms or heat waves and the areas they will affect. The biggest benefit is that people will know about approaching storms in advance and can prepare. So they try to predict the weather based on all of those different um, forms of technology. So here we have an image that says early Native Americans face challenging weather in the Midwest. So you had to know how clouds looked, you had to understand the patterns that were repeating in order for you to make an accurate guess. Now we can collect that data and then from there um, try to make a more accurate guess, but of course it is a hypothesis, so we're not 100% sure that it's automatically going to be like that, but usually if the information is similar to the past, then we can say it's pretty, pretty close. Today, satellites and radar help with weather predictions. And you can even stop and check 
uh, what conditions cause the variations in Midwestern weather? Natural resources. Many natural resources can be found in the Midwest. They have been used by people living in the region throughout time. Prairie grasses and wildlife. Tall, thick grasses cover the Midwestern prairie. The roots of the grasses reach deep into the ground for water. They are strong enough to keep the soil from eroding. Bison, buffalo or bison, once roamed the prairie by the millions. Other animals commonly found in the prairies are prairie dogs, deer, elk, bears, and wolves. Many species of fish live in the Midwest rivers and in the Great Lakes, including bass, pike, perch, walleye, and carp. Early people hunted for food, hunted and fished these animals for their food resources. Farming. Native Americans grew corn and beans in the Midwest. Later, settlers plowed the fertile soil to grow wheat. The area's nickname is America's breadbasket because so much wheat is grown there. Dairy cattle provide milk, butter, and cheese. Other livestock, such as hogs and chickens, also flourish there. And here we have an infographic talking about different prairie plants and what they're useful for. So it says here, Native Americans of the Midwest found beneficial uses for plants, which we still use today. So this one is echinia. Uh, the roots of the echinia plant were used by Native Americans for medicinal purposes. Then we have goldenrod. Um, about 60 species of goldenrod plants are found in, in North America. Native Americans use goldenrod to promote healing. Um, here we have milkweed, which got its name from the bitter milky juice in its stem. Native Americans use the stem to make strings for their bows. And we have blue, blue flax. Wild blue flax contained linen fiber. Blue flax was used by Native Americans to create strong rope. Forests of the Midwest. Before the 1700s, forests of pine, oak, aspen, and birch trees covered the upper Midwest. Settlers in the 1800s began to cut down the trees to use for building. Logging camps were built by 1910. Logging camps were built. By 1910, loggers stripped down forests in many areas. The modern lumber industry learned ways to harvest and plant trees to stop forests from being destroyed. So in the beginning, they didn't replant trees. They would just cut them down and then it caused grounds to become unstable. So whenever it would rain, because there were no roots of the trees holding the earth together, it would cause mudslides and it can still cause issues today. If you ever see um, dirt that's just staying still, when a lot of rain hits it, it becomes really moisturized and it'll eventually slide. And so now when we try to prevent that, we try to plant, um, even if they're a small plant, on top of empty dirt so that way it doesn't automatically slide if it doesn't rain. The roots keep it together. Minerals. Limestone deposits are found in Missouri and Kansas. Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan are good, good sources for metals such as iron, nickel, and copper. These minerals and metals can be used in building and manufacturing. Mining can affect the environment. Strip mining removes, removes minerals from the soil. The result is a patch of land which, on which few plants grow. Today, strip mines practice reclamation, a process that improves lands after they've been mined to make them useful again. So if you want to check, you can ask yourself, how have the natural resources of the Midwest been used over the years? And you can even ask yourself this for now because you already read about different ways that the Midwest is being used even today. Yes, we use it for crops, but what are some of the crops that we were talking about? We use it for mining. What are some of the minerals that we were talking about? Why did we harvest wood from there? Um, what animals used to live there? All of these things are important parts of why the Midwest is useful, why the Midwest is important to the United States. Native peoples. Many Native American groups called the Midwest their home, including the Miami Salk, the Powhatomi, the Cheyenne, the Kiowa, the Ojibwa, 
and the Shawnee. One group of this one group, the Sioux, consisted of several groups that spoke three language types: Dakota, Nakota, and Lakota. The Spanish and the Sioux. Before the 1600s, the Sioux people lived near Lake Superior. They fished, hunted deer and buffalo, and gathered wild rice. Conflicts with the Ojibwa people drove the Dakota people into what is now Minnesota. Their movement displaced the Nakota and Lakota peoples. The Nakota moved west into the North and South Dakota. The Lakota settled in the Black Hills of South Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana. Spanish explorers arrived in the Great Plains in the 16th century. They brought horses with them. Native Americans had never seen the animal before. Horses were not native to North America. So when uh, Europeans came over, they uh, were used as a form of trade because they were very helpful to, to help transport and travel. Some horses escaped from um, some horses escaped from the Spanish or were traded to the Plains people. The use of horses changed the lives of Native Americans forever. They learned to ride horses, which made hunting and traveling easier. By using horses, Native Americans could travel farther distances. Some groups, including the Nakota and Lakota, abandoned their communities to become nomads. They began traveling from place to place by horse. And here you have a painting of the Sioux hunting buffalo on the plain using horses. Hunting buffalo. While riding horses, Native Americans could hunt buffalo more efficiently. Large groups of Native Americans could work together to drive buffalo over cliffs and then harvest their meat. Much of the meat was dried on a rack to make it last a long time. Hides were used to make items like boats, clothing, and bedding. Horns were carved into spoons and ladles, while shoulder blades were used as hoes and rakes. Cooked hooves became glue, so they used all the parts of the um, buffalo, and they didn't, they didn't let any of it go to waste. The Sioux used parts of buffalo to make food, clothing, tools, and housing. That's the caption for that is what a buffalo looks like. Yes, it's similar to a cow, but it's not very similar. So you see why they're not called cows of America. The Sioux became, the Sioux followed the great buffalo herds from place to place. Buffalo became the main food source. The people lived in teepees or cone-shaped portable houses. To make teepees, buffalo hides were stretched over frames made of wooden poles. Some were large enough to house an entire family. When the time came to move on, teepees could be taken down easily and carried to a new spot. The Sioux wore clothes made of fur, suede, or leather. They traded buffalo meat and products for corn from groups of Native Americans who farmed. Over time, the use of horses allowed Native American groups to interact more, but it also include, increased warfare between them. So groups that may have been separated before or um, because of the distance and because of uh, not being able to travel as often, were now able to travel all over easier which if they already left because of other Native American groups, then um, that allowed them to, to uh, come back without having to worry about uh, the distance or traveling or exhaustion or any of that. And if you want to stop and check, in what ways did horses change the Sioux way of life? And that is the end of uh, lesson one in your textbook. So when you are filling this out, make sure that you're choosing supporting details for each portion. So here you're gonna be talking about the physical features of the Midwest and how did it benefit the Native Americans who were living there. We just read about all the different ways that um, the Midwest was helpful to whoever lived on it. We talked about even in the past and the present um, with, uh, in terms of food or in terms of wildlife, plants, even mining. So if you use all of those as your supporting details, make sure you explain why. So you can state with um, uh, the Midwest helped benefit the early people of the Americas by 
um, its ability to grow foods easily, um, large amounts of water nearby. And then for this question, how do tornadoes, the lake effect, and the seasons affect the Midwest? Um, if you have tornadoes happening pretty often, do you think that that will affect the people who live there? Do you think a person who lives in maybe Arkansas or Missouri or any of those states that are in the middle or in the Midwest, um, do you think that their houses are uh, going to be stronger? And if you compare it to the text, what do you think about um, people who lived before? So Native Americans that lived there before, do you think that their houses were as strong as our houses are now? If they were building it, not using the same resources that we're using. So make sure that you answer over here, your own answer. And then what natural resources did the inhabitants of the Midwest use? You guys read a whole page about the different resources of the Midwest. So make sure you show your supporting details. And then why were animals important to the Sioux? So again, use your details, use your resources, and then give your answer. Because you can't just have an answer without explaining your sources or where you got it from. Now for this page, you can be writing and setting evidence. Same idea as the other page. Um, the main question that it's asking you to do is, in what ways do the physical features, climate, and natural resources of the Midwest help and hurt early people? So it's talking about the pros and the cons for Native Americans who lived there originally. And you're gonna be using facts from the text to explain your response. So make sure that anything that you say here, you can prove it using the text. If you're going to say a pro, which is that maybe it was easy to grow food here. Um, there were not a lot of mountains. There were not many um, maybe uh, uh, the land was not surrounded by dangerous animals. Um, you could write all of those as ways that they helped the Native Americans who lived there. But if you know that that area also suffers from a lot of tornadoes, thunderstorms, which includes usually electricity or um, lightning and storms and all of that, and you know that flooding happens often, do you think that helped or that harmed the early people? And if you didn't have the technology or you didn't know how to check the weather by looking at the sky or looking or knowing the patterns from living there, do you think that that was a, a good thing? Or um, do you think the weather could have been something that harmed them as well? Make sure that you explain clearly using the information from the text. Then you're going to explain um, how you think people today use different use the natural resources to adapt to the climate of the Midwest in similar and different ways from the early people. So do you think that people today use the Midwest in a similar way or different way from the early people who lived there? We already know that um, there's gonna be some overlap because there's still people living there now, right? But pause for a second and think. What do you think that is the same between in the past using natural resources and um, to survive in that area and in the present? Because if you think about it, in the past, they mention how a lot of foods were grown there. They were, um, there was a lot of water. You don't have to worry about uh, droughts like California or Arizona. And do you think that that's similar to why people live there? How do you think that the natural resources, which are things that um, humans couldn't control, like rivers, like uh, fish, like all of these food sources, do you think that people who live there now still use those resources? Then once you're done with that, we're gonna go over to the explain part. Or, Connecting to the central question. We're going to pull it together using or answering the question, how does the Midwest climate and geography help define its spirit? So based on the information that we've read, so climate, 
which is talking about the weather, and geography, which is talking about the land. Um, we've talked about uh, how the land has helped people who live there. We've talked about how the climate is both helpful and harmful. And we've also talked about even um, the animals and the plants that, live, that are there. And so you're gonna be answering how the Midwest climate and geography define the Midwest. So are important, are essential, are useful to what the Midwest is, which is a, 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 a group of states that have similar features in common. So you're gonna be writing about explain an explanation using important details between the Midwest of the environment and um, what's there, what's not there, and how it helps the people who live there. Because all of those things make up its spirit, make up its key details, its key information, the important parts about it. And down here, you can write any project notes that you had. If you were, um, keeping track of interesting states based on the images that we saw, based on the readings that we did, you can write all of them down here. So make sure that you remember to complete your project. Um, once these lessons are done, you're going to have to present it. So make sure that when you do your research, you're answering those questions, you're looking for those answers carefully because they are important. And this is all that is due for Thursday. And next week you're gonna get started on why did people, why did different people move to and through the, the Midwest? For now, that's all that you have fourth grade and we'll see you next week.